situation. So Jesus has tried to prepare his disciples here, and he says this in John chapter 15. I'm going to go back up to 18 and work my, work my way down there. Jesus says this, and these are his words. If the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. I live by that verse these, time, these days. When I make a comment or when I stand up for a particular issue, I was in Lansing for the uh, Vaccine Choice uh, group there that uh, stand up for Michigan. Man, I got all kinds of hate stuff from folks because I was not following the science and I was not doing this and I was not doing that. And I said, what get away from me, Satan. But anyway, um, but it says, remember, they, they hated, Jesus says, remember, they hated me first. So I, I hold on to that passage on a regular basis. Verse 19, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. Now, we've looked at this just recently. We, we, we looked at that just a few weeks ago, that verse. They would love you as your own. In other words, if you agree with them, they're going to be happy. But the minute you disagree with them, they're not only going to be unhappy, but they're going to demonize you, and they're going to try to harm you, and they're actually going to try to squash you and keep you. But we also learned a few weeks ago that greater is he who is in us than what? Than he who is in the world. Amen. That's right. So he says... If you, uh, if, if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, because you agree with them. As it is, listen, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Now, of course, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and what is this, a disciple? A, disi a disciple, I can't even say the word. A disciple is someone who is a student of a teacher. Disciples were nothing more than students. Jesus was teaching them and then going to prepare them to go out and to share the message of Christ. So he says, I've chosen you. Guess what? If you're a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, he chose you as well. He called you out from that world system. He called you out from being like everybody else. You are different. So live that and love that in the name of Jesus. It goes on to say this. He says, remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. He says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also. Jesus says, look, I'm giving you my message. You're going to go out and share that. If they bust your chops, oh well. But if they listen to you, then they're actually listening to me, Jesus says. I pray every Sunday that you're not listening to Jeff, but you're listening to Jesus. I pray every Sunday that you're not paying attention to my goofiness, but you're pray, paying attention to His glory. That's right. You follow me? Okay. He goes on to say this. And then he says, uh, They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one, capital O, who sent me. Verse 22, where we're going to focus here today. If I had not come and spoken to them... They would not be guilty of their sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. Do you know what he was saying there? He said, look, if I hadn't come and I hadn't taught you what God's purpose or God's plan is for you, if I hadn't taught you, if I hadn't told you the way to heaven and the, the eternal security that you can have through faith in Christ, he says, if I hadn't told you, then no one would have known. But now... No one has an excuse to say, well, I just didn't know about Jesus. Right. You know, one of the saddest parts in, in my life is when I'm telling somebody about a, having a personal relationship with Christ, and I'll, and I'll ask them, say, so if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? And they say, well, I'd be somewhere, I guess. Well, and I try to tell them, I say, well, if you, what you believe wasn't true, would you want to know it? And they, sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. But when I get into sharing that, and I say, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And they go, I just don't want to. Now, I know some folks will say, well, you feel like you failed. I didn't fail in that, and you don't fail in that too when they say no. But the, you know what the saddest part is? Now that person is without excuse. Now they can't say that they have not heard the gospel message. Now they can't say, well, I, I never knew that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. I never knew any of this. You see, if Jesus had not come, and if He had not spoken, then there would be... There would be no reason to see a problem, but there is a problem. We are sinners by nature and by choice. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of their sin. But now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. 
Now I'm going to break this down in kind of a weird way, and you may find it a little weird, weirder than weird, than weird. But I want you to understand, I'm breaking it down. What does it mean for a man and a woman and a child? You see, I believe that's what the message of Jesus Christ is, is for. It's for every man, woman, and child in the world. It's definitely for every man, woman, and child in this room here this morning. But I, th I want to break it down on what it means if he had not come and what would have happened. Before we go any further, would you, uh, would you pray with me? Father, I just want to teach this. Uh, forgive me for my shakiness, my nervousness, just one of those kind of days, Father. But I know you want to speak a message. So I pray that you'd empower your servant to speak clearly and that the Holy Spirit would fill in all the gaps. And I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first question I want to ask you is, what would have happened if Jesus had not showed up? Now, we've already talked about that. If Jesus had not shown up, but what would that mean specifically? Well, first of all, if Jesus had not shown up, men would still be needy. Now, some of you women right now say, men are still needy. Well, I don't mean that. I mean that there would still be a need for uh, for uh, salvation. There would still be a need for forgiveness of sin. If Jesus had said show up, we'd still be in a world of hurt. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Look at this with me if you would. Look what it says. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature were not gods. In other words, those people that were over them and, of course, their own sin nature. He says, you are still a slave uh, because of the, of the condition that you were in. He said, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, and we've talked about that in the past, how is it that you are still turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Well, what was he talking about? Why are you still trying to hold to the law? Why are you still trying to sacrifice the animals? Why are you still trying to earn your way to heaven? He says, you are not only do you know God, but God knows you. So why are you still holding to these weak things that don't, don't fix your problem? We are sinners by nature and by choice, the Bible says. And I know that's not popular, but that's biblical. We all mess up. But praise God that when we mess up, there's a, a God who has, has hung up on the cross and given us forgiveness for our sins. He goes on to say, he says, why are you turning back to these weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Are you just wanting to continue to walk in an emptiness of your sin with no forgiveness, with no understanding what it means to have a personal, loving relationship with God? I have a whole lot more fun now as a saved man than I ever had as a lost guy. Amen. All because Jesus came into my heart. And that's not just some song we sing in church. That's real. And many of you know what I'm talking about. You still want to be a slave to your sin? That's no fun. I can remember many Friday nights going out and having a big party time and waking up Saturday morning going, oh man, this is horrible. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Not about my night, but about your night. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. That was an enslavement. I felt like I needed to go out and fill myself with alcohol so I could be happy. But I wasn't happy. Because even though Friday night, it seemed like it Saturday morning came. It's the same thing with our sin. Even though we think we can get away with it for a while, eventually we have to confess it. Don't we? Yep. Men would still be needy. What about women? Well, women would still be nothing. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That probably ticked somebody off. Let me explain before y'all start throwing things at me, okay? During biblical times, women had absolutely no rights. Uh, if, a, if a woman lost her husband, she had no means to support herself. Even when she had a husband, she was often herded like cattle in his house. His house. It was a terrible existence. But you know, Jesus broke that thing down. Oftentimes people say, well, well, Christianity is racist and sexist and all that kind of stuff. That is just not true. Jesus interacted with women in a way that allowed them to know that they meant something. And can I tell you something, ladies? You mean something to the kingdom of God. You are called by God in a special way. We make, uh, guys may, may, you know, tough and, you know. Yeah. You, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Toothpick arms here, bird lips. Okay, I got it. But anyway, you've got something special that God has to use and can use. Compassion, empathy, 
All of the things. Sometimes we make fun about emotional people, but I praise God for people that have a heart for other people. Jesus broke down those barriers because He interacted with women at a personal, not a sexual, but as a, in a personal way to let them know that they were not nothing, but they were necessary. They were important to the kingdom. In this passage right here, I know it's small, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. You remember? The woman had been messing around with some married guy, and the religious leaders bring him in front of Jesus, and they said, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. Now, they didn't bring the guy because they probably knew him. They didn't want to embarrass him, but they wanted to throw this woman under the bus. There wasn't a bus during biblical times, was there? But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. He says, this woman was caught in an act of adultery. Now, I didn't put all the words up here, just too long. The law of Moses tells us to stone such a woman. We're supposed to kill her because of this. So what do you say? And Jesus kind of writes down on the ground. He stands up and says, well, let me ask you a question. He says, those of you who are without sin, You'd be the first one to throw a stone. That's pretty wise. You know what it says after that? It says they begin to kind of look at each other. And then the older ones begin to drop their stones. And then the younger ones. You know what's happening there? When Jesus asked that question, if they were going to be honest with themselves, they had to recognize that they were not without sin. So they had no right to throw a stone at somebody whose sin was obviously thrown out there in public. Look what he says. After he asked that, he says, he says, let him be the first to throw a stone. And then he went down and he starts writing in the ground. And I've heard sermon after sermon about what Jesus was writing. We don't know, so don't worry about it. Whatever he was doing, he played play tic-tac-toe, tic-tac-toe. I don't care whatever he was doing. He was doing something down there, but he wanted them to think about it. So they think about it, and he says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. So here is Jesus standing with a prostitute or with a, a woman caught in the act of adultery. You see what he's doing here? He is helping her understand that she matters. I don't care what is in your past. I don't care what you've endured. I don't care. I take that back. I care what you've endured. I don't want you to use it as an excuse, though, to not serve the Lord because I'm telling you, you matter to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. He meets this woman where she is and she says, Woman, where are they? Where are all those people that brought you out here to stone you and kill you and embarrass you and, 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 and just rip you apart? He says, Has no one condemned you? And she goes, No, sir. He said, guess what? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. When women were regarded as nothing more than household items, Jesus says, I want you to know you are special. Women, please don't think for a second that somehow you're second class citizens in the kingdom of God. There are some churches that will make you feel that way. Not here at Four Winds. Because Jesus wouldn't make you feel that way. If Jesus hadn't come, women would still be regarded as something not very important. Let me put something else to you right here. If, what, what about children? Children would still be a nuisance. Now, I usually hear something like amen about that time. I, I don't want you to understand. I don't think kids are a nuisance. But understand, at the time, the disciples did. You remember the story there in Mark chapter 10? These people were bringing their children to Jesus so He could touch them and bless them and encourage them. And the disciples, because they're all full of themselves, right, you know, they, uh, and I'm just going to tell you right up front, if you don't like kids, you won't like this church. Because this church is focused on raising up kids with the gospel message, okay? We love kids. We're going to love kids. Go to some frozen chosen church out there somewhere else because we're going to love these kids because kids are not a nuisance. I had one lady in one of my churches, she says, those kids are making such a mess. Oh. <laughs> and clean it up. Or help ask them to help you clean it up. But we're not going to keep the kids from coming to Jesus. I used to get people fuss about vacation Bible school. I hope when we get our new church that we'll have a vacation Bible school or something yes. like that where the kids can come and all we can, we'll just invest in their lives. Many of you have got that gifts and talents. Be thinking and praying about that, that you could oversee something like that for our church. To invest in the young people in our church in a special way. 
And yeah, they're going to scuff up the walls, and yeah, they're going to break a chair or something like that, whatever it is. But they're not a nuisance. The disciples thought they were. Look at this. People were bringing little children to Jesus and having him touch them. But the disciples, right, here's the guys that have been hanging out with Jesus. They rebuked them. And Jesus, when he saw them, he got indignant. You know what that means? He was ticked off. Yeah. Hey, guys, what's wrong with you? These are little innocent children. They are, they are here to be molded. And if we don't help them find truth, if we don't give them the opportunity to know the truth of Jesus Christ, I guarantee you the devil will send them to the public schools. Oh, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. He said, let these little children come to me and don't hinder them. Don't keep them away. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You know what he was saying? He was talking about you and I. He said the faith of a child is so pure and so willing to receive the message of Christ. He says, I want my followers to have a childlike faith. Don't push the kids away. Kids are not a nuisance. If Jesus had not shown up, the men would be needy, the women would be nothing, and children would still be a nuisance. Can I tell you something? If we spend as much effort getting our kids to church as we do getting them to ball practice... We could change the world. And I know what some of you are saying. I don't have kids. You got grandkids? Heck, you got somebody else's kids. Pick up the phone and say, hey, we're doing a thing at our church. I'd love to have your kids come with us. Is that okay? Or you come with us, but I'd like to have your kids come. You say, that sounds creepy. Be creepy. It's all right. It's about kids. All right? If Jesus had not shown up, number two, I'm getting ahead of my, I'm getting, I'm getting a little long with it. If Jesus had not spoken, look what he says. Look what the verse says. He says there, he says, if I had not come, if I had not showed up, and if I had not spoken. So if Jesus hadn't spoken, what would have happened? Well, the first one is obvious. Men would not have heard. And again, these are interchangeable. I'm not saying that each one of these categories is exclusive. These are all applying to everybody. But we know how men are, right? You'll be talking to them. And you'll hear from the other room, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then you say, I just set the kitchen on fire, uh-huh. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I'm going to go and uh, do, set off a nuclear bomb downtown, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Sometimes men are like that. I hope we get more engaged, men, with our, with our spouses. But nevertheless, men would not have heard. They wouldn't have heard the message of Christ. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. People needed to hear that. And I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor, I, that's, there's some things in my life I've been trying so hard to find victory in. I'm just trying to get past this. I'm just trying to get victory in this, in this, in this situation. I'm telling you, friends, Jesus knows that, you're, that you're, you're like a slave to that sin. And He wants to give you the power. And He wants to give you the victory. But you've got to trust in Him. You've got to let Him be first and foremost in your life. You've got to let Him speak to you in those difficult times. You've got to be willing to walk in whatever that situation is and say, okay, Lord, I'm beginning to feel this, this tension, this anxious. I need your peace right now. And wait! And I promise you that He'll get it. I promise you you'll get it. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We know that. But we also read in Romans 6, 6. We know that our old self was crucified. Our old nature, when we became believers in Jesus Christ, when we gave our heart to Christ, our old nature was killed with Christ. You know what we keep wanting to do? We keep wanting to resurrect it. I am no longer going to drink. I'm no longer going to drink. Let's go to Applebee's for happy hour. I'm not going to drink. No, no, no. We'll go out here to Outback and go to there. But no, 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 I'm not going to do that. We don't take it captive and make it obedient. Our old self was crucified with Christ, with him, with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Ask yourself this question. Do I know Christ? Is he, is he my personal Lord and Savior? And if he's not, then there's your sin struggle. He fixes that. The Bible says the old is cast away, and the new person comes. Men would not have heard. Women would not have healed. What do I mean by that? Again, here's the passage out of Matthew chapter 9. 
This woman, she believed if she could just get close to Jesus, if she should just get up there and just touch the hem of his garment, she'd had this issue of blood for a long, long time. She was just bleeding, you know, woman-like things. It's as far as I'm going to go with that. I had three daughters, man, and that was never any comfortable conversation for me at all. I was... But anyway, so she had this issue of blood. And, and, and she just knew, she, if I could just get close to Jesus and just touch the hem of His garment, then I'll be made well. And so she goes up and she sneaks up there and she just touches the hem of the garment. And you know what Jesus says is, who touched, touched me? And of course, again, His disciples, you know, moron, uh, they're, they're all standing there going, Jesus, you're surrounded by people. What do you mean, who just touched you? He says, no, no, I felt the power go out of me. And he sees this woman, he calls her out, he says, he wanted to let her testify. Look what it says. She said, she says, if I could only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. And Jesus turned to her and says, take heart, daughter. He says, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Well, I prayed for so-and-so to be healed. Or I prayed for this situation to be made right. Brother John was just telling me he got a good report from the oncologist this week. Man, I'm so excited to hear stuff like that. We're hearing prayer being answered. We're hearing God moving mightily. But I, some people sit there and say, well, God's not answering my prayer. you got to ask yourself, what's up? Why is that? Are you praying believing? Or are you, pray, are you praying saying, God, I'm demanding you fix this situation? You know what? When my wife, we prayed for my wife's healing, uh, she was healed. That's right. When she went to heaven. So don't think that God's not listening. He is still in the healing business. And this woman knew if she just got up near Jesus that she could be made right. And Jesus says, your faith in me, in my strength, in my power, that has made you well. And she was healed from that moment. Men would not have heard. Women would not have been healed. Children, they would not have hope. If there's anything that I'm hearing these days, they're, they're saying, I'm sad about the world that my kids are growing up in. You know, my parents said the same thing about me. They were sad about the world that I was going to have to grow up in. But we made it. And this generation will make it too. They've got to have hope in something greater than some, whatever's going on in our nation. They can't look at the newscasts and they can't read the newspapers and go, oh, well, it's all falling apart. They have to have hope. We have to give them that hope. Again, that's what Four Winds wants to do. We want to invest in the life of these young people so that they will understand that even though everybody else tells them how bad things are and how bad things are going to be, Jesus wants them to know that He's coming back and that we're going to leave this place and go be with Him in heaven for all eternity. They need to have hope. And we're the messengers for that hope for that next generation. The Bible says in Matthew 18, and whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me, Jesus says. In what way? With open arms and a willingness to invest in their lives. My prayer for our church is to have children's programs, to have children's choirs, to have... have, have uh, all kinds of opportunities made available to them so that their life would be centered around the church, not an afterthought. People sometimes will say, well, I'll come to church if nothing else is going on. I want everyone to say, I'm going to, I, I'm going to, if you want me to do that, I can't because I'm going to be in my church. That's my heart and my prayer for our young people. You too. You too. But anyway, he says, he says, uh, welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me, Jesus was saying there's an, innate, there's an inborn desire for God. Every child has it. They just stand around adults that trash on it. And it becomes weak, less and less. But he says, if anyone calls one of the ones who believes in me to stumble, he says, I got something for them. He said, quite frankly, it would be better for them to have a millstone. You know what a millstone is, right? Big, huge rock that they use to crush grain and stuff with. Very heavy, one person couldn't handle it. It would be better for them to have one of those things hung around their neck and be, them, let them be tossed in the sea. It would be like somebody handing you a boat anchor from, a, from the Queen Mary and say, here, go for swimming. Go swimming. Jesus said, that's how important kids are to me. Kids, children are a gift from God. We need to remind them of that. Not treat them like they're perfect. And, and not allow them to say, well, 
pastor says, I'm a gift from God. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll still tan your hide. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but, but look at them as what they are, a gift, a precious, special gift from God. And the Bible says that in numerous places. He said it would be better for them to have a, and them to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Children would have no hope. Men would not have heard. Women would not have been healed. Children would not have any hope. Again, going back to the text here, what it says, verse 22, If I had not come and spoken, they would not be guilty of their sin. However, they have no excuse for their sin. If Jesus had not, come, had not shown up, if Jesus had not spoken, then Jesus would not have saved. He would not have given us the assurance of eternal life. You say, well, I want life now. Jesus actually promises that. How many of you can say amen to John 10.10 10, when Jesus says, I have come to give them life and give it to the fullest? How many of you can say that, that that's exactly right? That I wasn't living until I came to know Christ. That I was just existing. That I was just going from day to day. I was just going from, from sin to sin. I was just jumping from person to person or situation to situation. Nothing was making sense. Then Jesus came into my life. He promised, he says in John 10, 10, I have come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. That means not just here, but for all eternity. If he had not come, there would be no salvation, which means men would still be held bound. Some of you think all men are anyway. It's hard being a man right now. You know that? You know, men are supposed to be men, but the world's trying to make us all a bunch of sissies. Oh, you can't be tough and you can't be responsible and you know all that kind of stuff. You're trying to make us into a bunch of wimps. Next thing you know, you'll Jesus be was a man's man. What? Next thing you know, you'll be wearing a man bun. No man bun here. I guarantee you that. Look at that bald spot. <laughs> there ain't no man bun coming on this thing. This is yeah. it. It was funny. I went in to buy a motorcycle helmet just recently. I'm taking a little trip and I wanted to have a regular helmet. Usually I wear one of those little goofy little ones, a little half helmet. You know, but I figured I better get a good size helmet because my girls are always saying, Dad, please wear a helmet when you're on the motorcycle. I said, okay. So I walk in. Now some of you aren't going to get this, but some of you are. So I walk in. I start trying on motorcycle helmets. Remember the Flintstones? There was that little alien dude named Kazoo. That's what I looked like with a motorcycle helmet on. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was like, you know... A, a, could barely hold it up. It's big, huge. They said, what size do you wear? I said, I wear a double extra large. They went, <laughs> But I bought a helmet, Taylor, just for you guys. Are you happy? Good, I'm glad. I was going somewhere with that. Whatever. Oh, yeah, men are held up. That's right. Uh, so let me point out to you what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 8, verse 4, What is man that you remind of him? Son of man that you should care for him. God, why would you care about us? Because he made us. And he has a purpose for every one of our lives. He doesn't want you just to exist. He wants you to prosper. I'm not talking prosperity theology where if you name it, you claim it, you know, you call it, you haul it, whatever. I'm talking about wants you to be successful at life through His direction, through His plan. He says, why would you care about us, Lord? I made you. I am the creator that has endowed, endowed you with certain unalienable rights. You ever read that document there? Among those rights are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. I don't know if you've heard that document. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 and 30. Remember that at a time when you were separated from Christ. Remember what it was like to be lost? When I go back to my hometown, I'll run into people and they'll go, You remember that time? No. I don't want to remember that time. Because that's when I was separated from Christ. But the Bible says we should not forget that. Remember what it was like to struggle. When, you would, when, when people would come to you and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Get away from me, you crazy person. I can remember saying that numerous times. There was a girl in, my, in, in, in our, my school. Her name was Alicia. Now she's a professional evangelist and singer. She, you've heard, probably, maybe you've heard of Alicia. That's her. It's just this girl. She sings at all kinds of conferences and all kinds of concerts. An amazing vocalist. Well, she was in my choir. She was in my choir. And she would share the gospel with me all the time. And I'd say, leave me alone. Fast forward 20 years later, I'm at a conference, and she's there. And so I walk up to her, and I said, Hey, Alicia, just uh, wanted you to know that uh, I got saved. And uh, I'm a pastor now. 
And I really told her seriously, I said, I want to thank you for at least express, expressing a, a concern for me. At least you planted the seeds. It didn't take root right then, but I remember you, and I want to thank you for that. You should go back and thank the person that shared the gospel with you. Tell me, appreciate it. I had that opportunity with Alicia. Remember when you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise. You had no relationship with God. He goes on to say, without hope and without God in the world. But now, I love that part of the Bible. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. One moment you were a long way away from God. Some of you still think that God's a long way away from you. He's still where He's always been. He's just wanting you to come back. But once you come back, He's not going to let you go. Men would still be hell bound. Women would still be helpless. I'm not saying women are helpless. But there was a lot of struggles back there. Look at this passage right here. He, Matthew 15, verse 20. A woman came and knelt before Him. Lord, please help me. Jesus was talking, and, and, and this woman shows up. She's in, in, in a lot of a need. and all. He says, Lord, can't you just help me? And Jesus says something that sounds kind of harsh, and I know we wouldn't think about that. He says, why should I stop and give uh, the food uh, to, to a dog? Uh, and basically, that sounds horrible. Is it right to take children's bread and toss it to the dog? And, uh, you know, he, we are his children as, a, as the followers of Jesus Christ. She says, is it right for me to do that? And she says, yeah, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs from the master's table. Yeah. And he says, you know what, you're, you're right. And he blessed her. Look what it says. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. You say, well, these are stories in the Bible. You think God's changed his mind in any of this stuff? The Bible says the reason we don't get a lot of the things is we don't ask for them. We don't ask. Lord, I need you to help me with my marriage. God says, okay, let's work on you first. Yeah. I mean, isn't that usually what the problem is? Lord, if you just fix them, it'd be all right. No, 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 we're going to work on you first. Then we'll work on your marriage. Anyway. Three, children will be homeless. Now again, we are children of God, so I use this as a reason, as an explanation. Understand what the Bible says. Proverbs 14, 26. He who fears the Lord has secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. Fear the Lord means to believe in God, to believe in Christ. To have that respect and that awe of God. He says, if you will trust in me, I will give you refuge. Refuge in your struggles. Refuge in your celebrations. I will protect you and provide for you. That's my promise. He said that my children have that. Many kids today are just floundering. They're listening to the junk in schools. They're not getting any opposing views. We were talking about that just before church. I think it was Kyle and I were talking about that. He says, you know, this is in the schools. He says, he says that you're just getting one side of every story and they're not hearing any of the opposing views. I thought school was to teach us to think. I always tell you in this church, I said, just don't take my word for it, read it yourself. Study it yourself. Make sure what you're hearing from the pulpit is accurate. Children need to know that too. Got one, two more verses for you. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. God says, look, once I got you, I will keep you. I happen to believe in the eternal security of the believer. I happen to believe that once a person is saved, they're always saved. They may, uh, they may walk away and they may be miserable for a while, but I believe that God says, come on back. Just like that prodigal father. Not the prodigal son, but the father that loved his son so much that he stood on the porch waiting for the boy to come back. And when he did, he ran to him. He put his arms around and said, son, I'm glad. Once with you who once were lost are now found. Right. No one can snatch him out of my father's hand. Bring us to our last verse here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. The condition of our world, the stuff that we see on the news, I'm hearing more and more people say, you know, I've just turned the news off. And I have too. I've, I've just, I said, you know what? I don't care whether you're, whether you're CNN or MSLSD or... Uh, uh, you know, Fox News or whatever it is, Fox and the Hen House News, whatever it is, I don't care. I've turned it off.
because I was getting everything that they wanted me to get instead of what God wanted me to get. Look, God makes us stand firm in Christ, and that's what we need to do. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't know what's going on. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But if you're feeling, ask yourself this question. How much time am I filling myself with worldly stuff versus the things of God? If you're spending more time looking on the internet to see what the latest struggle is or what Joe Biden has said or whatever, and you couldn't even find some of the books in the Bible yet, maybe you need to switch gears. That's right. Definitely switch channels. Yep. It says, he, ha he has anointed us, set uh, His seal of ownership on us, and put us, put it, and put His Spirit, notice the capital S, who are we talking about there? Holy Spirit, He put the Holy Spirit in us as a guarantee of all the promises. A guarantee. I get a guarantee from on a washing machine that lasts 90 days, if that. 103 days later, it breaks down. Well, your warranty's out of date. Well, you're a moron. I don't say that. I'm never, mad. I'm never mean to people on the phone. But anyway, He guarantees it. And what God guarantees, He follows through. He put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. That's just the down payment for what He has for us when we get to heaven. If He had not come and He had not spoken, we'd have missed out on all this. I was reading... They put out books for pastors and their little encyclopedias of illustrations because we're not too smart, so we gotta get our illustrations from different places and I'm just being very transparent. I can't always think of an illustration, so I look in the books and I find little things. And this guy wrote, this guy named Henry uh, Bosch, Bosch, I guess, B-O-S-C-H, wrote this thing down. And this is what he said, and I really, I thought it was pretty cool. He said, Socrates taught for 40 years. Plato taught for 50 years. Aristotle for 40 years. And Jesus for only three. Yet, the influence of Christ's three years of ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years of teaching from these three men who were among the greatest philosophers of all antiquity. Those three guys, 130 years of teaching, and how many of us can quote Socrates and Plato? And... But I hope if you're a child of God that you can at least share a few verses. I took this into the. I go to a restaurant right every morning for breakfast because I hate cooking early in the morning. So I go in there. I take my little cup right there, and the waitress comes. Oh, John three sixteen. For God does uh, us. Uh, um, uh, um, yeah, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son. That whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. No, this one at least. Yeah. And then I always get this. Well, I go to church. Jesus painted no pictures, yet some of the finest paintings of Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci received their inspiration from Jesus Christ. Jesus wrote no poetry, but Dante, Milton, and scores of the greatest poets were inspired by him. Listen to this. Jesus composed no music, yet Haydn, and Handel, and Beethoven, and Bach, and Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection of melody in the hymns, symphonies, and oratories they composed in His praise. Amen. This is my little bit. As amazing as all that is, the most important thing to remember is if Jesus hadn't showed up and Jesus hadn't spoken, then none of us, none of us would be saved. All those other guys had influence, but no more than Jesus Christ. And if He had not, Look what we would have missed out on. Let's pray together. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question. With what I was talking about today, things like salvation, eternal life, maybe for some of you here today, that that's just doesn't make any sense to you. And maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's okay. Believe me, we all have been there. But if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to know Christ today, 
And nobody's looking around, no, nobody's looking at me. You're looking at the floor and nothing else, but I'm asking you to be praying. If you've never given your heart to Christ, but you want to, would you just slip your hand up here this morning? Let me see that hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, see? See? It's not about how long you've been in church. It's about when you've come to the cross. So for the rest of you who didn't raise your hand, and especially those of you who were embarrassed to raise your hand but knew you needed to, I'm going to pray a little prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray this in your heart. And just ask God to come in. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And the rest of you just pray in your own way. Quietly. Heavenly Father. I don't know why you led me to this particular passage. But we all know right now. That we're without excuse. We can't say that we never heard. We can't say. That we don't know. You can to die for the sins of the world. And I'm part of that world. So Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that each person in their heart would call out to You and ask You to forgive them of their sins. And Father, that they would ask You to help them live their life for You. Father, that they would say, Lord, save me now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, that may have been a big step for some folks. And I know that you've already affirmed to them. You've, been, you, you've given them that spirit you talked about. You've guaranteed that assurance. You, you, if the person that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You've told us that. Let us now help them in their walk with you. Let us encourage them in their relationship with you. Let them understand more and more as they grow in their faith. And let us as a church agree that we will help them. God, we love you. We thank you for showing up. We thank you for speaking out. And we thank you for saving a wretch like me give you all the praise for it in Jesus name amen and amen. amen hey I want to thank you for tuning in it's always a blessing to know that there are people that are listening to our messages and being encouraged by the Word of God we'd like to invite you to come and join us at Four Winds Church we meet at the Marquee Theater at 135 East Main Street in downtown North Bend. Uh, we meet at 11 o'clock we ask you to bring your Bible because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to read it yourself. You can also go to our website at fourwindslove.org. That's fourwindslove.org. And get information there. I hope we see you next Sunday. God bless.